And what a joy to be in this church and see it full and see what God's doing for you and what Brother Pratt is doing and how God's touching and moving his life. And I remember when Greg came out here. And, uh, of course, Sister Stella, she came along later on. But uh, once you get out here in this Arizona and you get out of that Indiana snow and rain and sleet, I mean, you have to have something wrong with you if you go back. I'm just telling you right now. So I know I'm talking to a bunch of smart people in this house today because you have found Canaan's land. And uh, I have made several trips out here in ministry, and most every time I've come, I've always tried to hike Squall Peak. But I'm going to leave it out of the, the agenda this time and just stay on flat land. <laughs> and what a beautiful place uh, this is, and what a wonderful group of people come here. The history of this uh, state as far as revival is such a wonderful story. The first preacher of Pentecost to come across the mountain up there out of gas. And he prays and God brings him on in miraculously to Phoenix. And then a great revival took place. And that's where your roots are. And to see where you're getting ready to go, it's just it just blows my mind. God's gave you this piece of property and... Um, a good group of united people, and nothing is impossible with the Lord. Absolutely nothing. And um, I hear that you have a Marshallese church going. I uh, had an uh, experience to be with about five of them in Arkansas. And, uh, and uh, it's amazing what's happening in this world. God is just making us one, and the church is uniting, and, and fantastic what God's got in store. And God's doing a fast thing today. We're getting ready for the coming of the Lord. He could come today. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he did come today. Because more of the signs that we are looking for today, we're seeing today, are those signs that precede his coming and touching the Mount of Olives. But his coming in the air, there's no other signs preventing him from coming while we're in this service today. And even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And uh, to see these young men, and I use that kind of loosely, uh, loosely when I'm talking about Greg and, and, and Shay, your overseer. Uh, I've known these, these young men most of their life. And I'm so thrilled to see them doing the work of the Lord. I want to tell you, Abigail and Shay will not leave this state like they came. And I hope they stay here for 25 years because something is happening. I saw something in your prayer conference that I have never seen before in a state, and especially here. It is a breath of God that's breathing on you. So, you know, you, when the Holy Spirit moves like that and the waters are trouble, get in them and get the best out of them. And, and uh, so I'm just glad to be here, and I'll get to visit with you a little bit after a while. I would like to ask you to turn with me to the book of Ruth. You know, not many preachers preach from the book of Ruth. Ruth is what you... Read when somebody's getting married. You know how it is. Some little old girl stands at an altar and some big old boy stand there beside of her. And, and uh, they say, well, honey, uh, I'll go anywhere you want to go. And he looks at her and says, I'll go anywhere you want to go. And all of them sweet things are said. And they get married. And they buy them a house trailer and put it in their mama's backyard. And that's the way it goes, buddy. That's what I call living, brother. Amen. Don't get, don't get far from the tree and hang with it. I've got my kids, my grandkids. Well, I won't start there, but I do have the best. I'm not kidding you. And um, Hannah was here painting last uh, at, at youth camp. And while people preach, she paints. And uh, several of my kids are working in ministry today, and I'm just thrilled about it. Uh, the Word of God in the book of Ruth uh, I want to talk to you today about remembering and returning and renewal. Have you ever gone through a long, dry place in your Christian experience? And I know when you have to face battles and, and questions that you can't answer and, and this why me, Lord, and stuff, it could take a real toll on you. And if you aren't careful, you can get kind of dry in your spirit. And it's times like this that we come together and uh, the church comes into agreement. And as we come into agreement together, we're made strong because one can put a 1,000 to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. Literally, that's what this church service is about today, for you to be renewed in your spirit and go out of this building 
and serve the Lord. And I believe that he's going to meet with us today. In chapter 1, if you wouldn't mind, would you stand with me if you possibly can? I want to direct your attention to the 19th verse of the book of Ruth. And in Ruth chapter 1, verse 19, it reads like this. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And listen to this. I went out full, and the Lord had brought me home again empty. You ever been empty? You ever been full, and you just go through those long, dry spells? And she says, uh, I, and the Lord brought me home empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Shall we pray? Lord, we bring all things under your control in the name of Jesus. Every person in this house, every individual, I pray every demon of hell will fade away and only the glory of God be lifted up in this place. And we pray you touch our lives today and touch us as we minister your word because we desperately need you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. You may be seated. I'm a little fumbly. I have had surgery on my eyes and I fell out of a pulpit over in Tennessee and broke my arm, so uh, it's hard to tell what I'll do here today. If I start to fall, I'll try to dodge those drums. I, I normally will try to find a good piece of carpet to go down on, but anyway. And I'm gradually getting there. If any of you have ever get to our age, they say, well, you're like that. The first thing you want to do is put an implant in your eye. And this guy messed up, and he said, you're, you're one in 60,000. Well, I'm a Christian, but I just felt like just busting his nose. I said, why couldn't you make it 60,000? <laughs> but anyway, I have a little trouble, but I'm gradually getting adjusted to it, and you give me a little leeway there. There's a story. A story, let me just tell it to you. There are two women. They're coming down a dusty road. And in my mind, I just see their hair pulled back and a bunch of old straggly clothes on. They haven't had a manicure, let alone a pedicure. Haven't even been to a beauty shop. And they're coming down a dusty road. And everybody sees them coming. And they start whispering, can this be Naomi? You know how it is if, uh, they, if they whisper something, you can hear it on the other side of the church. But if your wife wants you to take out the garbage, she has to look you in the eye and say, read my lips. Man. <laughs> Just certain things we want to hear, you know what I'm saying? And she hears somebody say, can this be who I think it is? Like you, when you go back to your 25th or the 50th reunion to graduate from high school, you put that stuff on your head, makes it look you got hair, and, and when you sweat, it runs down your face, and, and you suck in to them veins in your neck stick out, and uh, you ride up in a new Lincoln Town car, but you forget to take the budget car renter stick off the bumper. And, and somebody said, is that who I think it is? That's the kind of situation that's here. You've been a long way, old gal. I don't know who you are, but could you possibly be Naomi? We haven't seen her here lately. She says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra. For I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. You see, a great significance in names. Well, in fact, my dad was at the Battle of the Bulge when I was born. That's how old I am. And he wrote a letter back to my mother, said, Edith, when that boy is born, said, name him Elmo. Thank God the letter didn't get there. 
Now, they may be two or three Elmo's here. God bless you. You're going to make it to heaven. But if I'd have got a handle like that, Pastor Greg said, we got tickle me Elmo day here for sure. Right? <laughs> she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra. For I am a bitter person. My, what a trick of the devil. He'll take some kind of disability. He'll take something that's happened to you that's beyond your control. That's how it happens. That's why you get busy. Why me? You know, why does it happen to me? You know, it'll influence and sort of taint our whole life because we got this little bitterness. We got this little chip here. So don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra. I'm a bitter person. And there are people today who are not really experiencing the joy of the Lord because bitterness is in their heart. In fact, some people are sick because bitterness is in their heart. Things you could not do anything about, it just happens. So let's get, a, let's get a good grip of the story here. And You have to go back to chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, there was a famine in the land. I hate to tell you this, but there are going to be good times and bad times. In every church. You can't, you can't run, you can't get away from it. When you unpack your suitcase, you're going to go through the same thing until you kill that trick of the devil. And he says, well, there was a day when the judges ruled. And it is said of the judges that everybody did that which was right in their own sight. And then there was a famine. A famine in the land. And the scripture says, and there was a man whose name was Elimelech. And he decided to get up and get his family and sojourn down to Moab. Sometimes we think we can outrun our problems and we've got to take a stand and face it. Look at this situation. Here he is. He's a, his name is Elimelech. Now, Elimelech means God is my king. That's not a bad name if you ask me. God is my king. He was married to a woman whose name was Naomi. And Naomi means a sweet and a pleasant woman. If you're sitting beside of your wife, don't move a muscle right now. I've got to ask a question. How would you like to be married to Sister Sweet and Pleasant? Well, she's in Colorado. No wonder you can say that, buddy. You're hoping somebody call and tell her what you said, but I'm probably the only one to call it, so there you go. And they got two boys. One boy's name is Mylon, and the other boy's name is Chilion. Mylon means perfect, and Chilion means joy or song. You got any perfect kids around your house? Ask your sister-in-law. She'll tell you the truth about your low-down youngins. Brother God is my king, married to sister sweet and pleasant. One boy named Joy, and another boy named Perfect. And they live in a town called... Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem means city of bread. Buddy, I tell you right now, that's my kind of living. I don't care how you slice it. Your wife's name is perfect. Uh, uh, Naomi is, is sweet and pleasant. And one boy named Perfect and the other boy named uh, Joy. And, and here you do. You live in a town called a bakery. <laughs> that ain't bad living, you ask me. And they don't live in, in Arizona. They live in Judea. Now, you had to get a hold on this now. Brother God is my king. Married to sister sweet and pleasant. They got one boy named Joy. Another boy named Perfect. And they live in a town called a bakery. And in a state called praise the Lord. <laughs> Judea means praise the Lord. And you know what they did? They moved. <laughs> they could not take it, honestly. Sometimes we have things. Hey, let me tell you something. You don't realize what a wonderful privilege it is to have an old-fashioned church like this sitting down here on the interstate that believes in the power of the Holy Ghost. You come in here and just slide in here and just praise God and, and glorify Him. There's a lot of places you won't have that. 
It's a good place to shake off all your bonds. It's a good place just to get loose in the spirit. It's a good place just to come and pour your heart out. It's a good place to say, I won't leave here like I came in Jesus' name and go out the door praising God. Well, hallelujah. So what did they do? They moved to Moab. Moab, Lot's daughter, licentious living. Moab doesn't matter. Moab means just below the promised land. Is that not where we live sometimes? Just below our privileges in Christ? We can see where we need to go, but we're down here in this place. Jeremiah 48 and 11 gives a description of Moab, the place they moved to. It says in Jeremiah 48 and 11, it says this. It says, Moab has been at ease since his youth. He has set on his lees and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither have he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste has remained in him and his sin has not changed. Let me just give you a little Dennis McGuire commentary on that. Moab has been at ease. If you really want to get discouraged in church, just get to thinking you can come in and sit, soak, and sour and get out the door. You were built for battle. You were built to disturb the devil's kingdom. You're built to, and you have the anointing on you to tell the devil to flee. You're really something super, and you just sit on the sideline and not get involved. Lord have mercy. I'm going to. Think about it. That's where the American church is. They won't come and slide down in a, a chair, preach if you can, brother, sing if you can, and a world dying and going to hell out there. God has given you opportunities and, and, and gifts that use for him. If you don't use your gift and get involved in ministry, it's a good chance you can get sour and bitter because you weren't built to be idle. So when you go over to Moab, it's a place where, you know, they're at ease. And it says, they have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. If you serve the Lord, you hear me? If you serve the Lord, you will be broken and poured out and spilled out. If you haven't had the devil slap you around two or three times, you just get involved in church. If you sing, you'll sing too loud. And or you might not sing loud enough. Or it might be this song or that song. You know what I'm saying? And if you can get hurt, if something can bother you, then you're going to get it. You're going to get knocked off, brother, because the devil's after you. And if you in church, if you're in church, the devil really intends in some way to get you to separate from the body. Always right. Says he's been at ease since his youth. And if you serve God, you're going to be broken and poured out and spilled. But you never judge a man when everything's going all right. It's when he's broken and poured out and spilled out. It's when a man can say, I know my Redeemer liveth. And though the skin worms devour this body, yet in my flesh shall I see the Lord. It's when you come to that place. The devil can't shake you loose. But something's happened here. They have left the city of bread in a time of famine. So... The Bible says they've not been emptied from vessel to vessel. And he tells us that they have rested on their leaves. The leaves was this. Once you get all the old grape, all the grape juice out of the grape, you're left with the hose. And what they would do, they would pour water over it and squeeze it again. That's the way some people's experience is with, the God, with God. They're living on yesterday. What happened before? God needs to squeeze, you, squeeze us again. I mean, there's some juice still in those. Oh, oh, and let's get busy. The joy of the Lord. But this is what happened. They go to Moab and they sojourned and then they continued there. They, people never expect not to be involved in the church. Well, I think I'll just take a little rest and they get bitter. They get separated. The devil wants to separate you from God's people. If we would live by the parable of the banana, we'd really be successful. It's said of the banana... If it had stuck with the bunch, it would have never gotten peeled. You need to stick with God's people through good times and bad times. Now they say, 
Therefore, his taste has remained in him and his scent has not changed. The thing that happens when you get out of fellowship with the Lord and out of harmony with God, you can see it in everybody else's life, but you can't see it in your own life. Huh? So the Bible says that their scent has remained in them. The taste has not changed. It's discernment. Right, let's just try something. I don't know what you put on this morning to help you. I can't smell mine, and my nose got used to that, and it quit. Does yours do that? Can you smell your own? Huh? Well, right guard is for both arms, I understand. If you... <laughs> Since you can't smell yourself, you might be stinking and don't know it. You can smell everybody else, but you can't smell your own stinking self. That's how people get bitter. They can see it in the preacher. They can see it in somebody else. And all of a sudden, they're over here, and they got all these problems, and they're bitter, and they're away from God. They were full, but now they're empty. I always found out how to find out if you really stink. Just ask your wife. Dear Lord, she'll tell you the truth every time. But the problem we get ourselves in, the reason we don't have the joy of the Lord is that we've got our eyes on somebody else and we're seeing what's going on there. And it just seems that we can't see or smell our own self. And the only way you're going to get closer to God and get back to God is when you take the responsibility and say, it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. If I've gone out full and I'm empty now and I don't have what I used to have, it's because I have not seen myself. Well, there's some consequences about living down in Moab. Because you see, Elimelech just went there for a while. But he died there. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. Now, here she is. She's a widow in a pagan land. No social security, nothing else. She's out of it. She's got two boys. Mylon and Chilion. They married two girls, Orpha and Ruth. And so help me the boys die. And here she is with nothing. Brothers and sisters, don't let the devil pull you away from the church. Don't let the devil separate you from the body. Something will happen in your life that you'll need God's people close by your side. And if you're tonight and you just really hadn't been where you should be with God, and if you've ever had a day in your life when you've been closer to God, you need to move up. Because there's a great new opportunity open to you. God wants to fill you with blessings like you've never had. So she calls her two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth. And she tells them, verse 6 I think it is, she had heard in Moab that God had visited his people. It's critical where you hear that God loves you. I mean, you can be in the church and hear God, That's, but when you're busted and disgusted and everything else has gone wrong, and suddenly God comes to you the second time and says, get up and let's go somewhere. Let's go back to an altar. Let's go back to a place of beginning. Let's go place, back to a place of joy. She told these two girls. Well, naturally, they had a crying fit. Orpha said, well, I guess I better go back to my mama. Well, you ought to. Because I'm an old woman. I ain't got no more babies coming. You, you fall, you're going wrong. And, but Ruth said, hey, now where you go, I'm going to go. I'm going with you. And she said, you can go back. No, no. Whether thou goest, I will go. And where you lodge, I'll lodge. And your people will be my people. I've got nothing to offer you, girl. I've lost it all. You ever been to that place? Kids gone, problems, difficulty. I've lost it all. But I know of a place where Jesus has a table spread, where the saints of God are fed, and I'm going to rise up and I'm going home. It's going to take a whole lot of grit to go because when I left out, I was rather pompous. We were on the wagon telling everybody goodbye. 
So she starts back. You know, that book is, I, I tell you, I believe I could preach a year out of the book of Ruth. So many things. But when you get from Moab back down to Bethlehem, there's only one way for you to go. You have to go through Judah. If you have been on a long journey and you're cold and indifferent in your heart, things just aren't right, I tell you, I'd get back to God. You walk back through praise. Judah's praise. Praise God. Glory to God. If the devil could have killed you, you'd have been dead a long time ago. But thanks be unto God. The devil didn't give it to me, and he can't take it away. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I will arise. I'll walk through praise. My toes are stumped. My, my head hurts. Everything. I got all kinds of problems. But I'm going home, and I'm going. The only way I can get home, I've got to go home through praise. You don't have to come down here and snort around and tell God how bad you are. He knows exactly how bad you are. You need to throw your head up and say, praise God. I didn't die in Moab. I see there's a hope for me and get up and go. Hallelujah. She's coming home. And I see him coming to Bethlehem. Can this be Naomi? Well, y'all got it too. I was kind of looking for a tambourine, but they hide them in Pentecostal churches because the guy that, huh? The guy that plays it never keeps time. So, you know. Anyhow, they had tambourines. They're coming home. It's at the beginning of the barley harvest. They've been broken and disgusted and beat up, but now there's dancing in the street. When they turn the corner, they're hungry, but there's a feast coming down the road. There's a feast because it's the barley harvest and they're singing and dancing in the street. It's springtime. And anytime you get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you get up and you start back to God, I'm preaching to somebody here today that God's called you to preach and he's put his hand on you. He's got a work for you to do, but you're sitting on the sideline because you're nursing yourself. But when God touches you, it's time to get up and go home. There's dancing in the street. God is ready to mend all the problems of your life. So here they come. It's the barley harvest. Springtime. Stella, when I used to work up in down in South Carolina, or down in Florida, I had people tell me, you know, I won't be here next week, Brother McGuire. What's the matter? Well, I'm going to the mountains. I want to see the leaves change. And I think, oh, God, have mercy. You think, are my people sitting up on a hot rock? What are you doing? Watching leaves change. <laughs> Fall of the year. And I like to froze there, you know, Fort Wayne, down to Indianapolis. I was caught in a, caught in a, a, a whiteout. I was in a van, and I pulled in Anderson, Indiana. And I told them I don't have a place to stay. What I was going to do, just write a note that says, here lies a frozen fool. He could have had nine orange trees, three orange trees in the backyard, but he wouldn't move to Indiana. Be looking out the window when they dig me out. But I got out of it. The reason I got out of it, they thought I was a first Church of God preacher at the Marriott place. They gave me a suite. Church of God, Church of God, as far as I'm concerned, it's snowing. I don't really like the fall of the year. I don't want to miss one. I don't care about winter. People down South Georgia, they think they're friendly. They're, they're not waving at you. They're trying to catch gnats in the summertime. I want to tell you what I like. I like springtime. You ain't got much of springtime around here, but you do have a springtime. There's a time when the leaves start, uh, the, the flowers start blooming, and it's just a difference about the change of singing, and you can say it's springtime. Hallelujah. I tell you, that's the way it is. And they came home, old things pass away, new, old things become new, and they came home. Well, let me kind of speed this up. We need to beat the Baptist to the buffet if we possibly can. I won't be long. You don't want to miss what I'm getting ready to tell you. But she comes in here. These two women. And they don't where to go. They just know they're home. And, and Ruth decides she's going to try to help. She gets up and she goes to glean in some fields. Now, the Old Testament law was you had to leave some 
of the harvest so that the poor could get it. And she goes and she starts gleaning in the harvest. Ruth does, the Moabitess woman, the woman that's an outcast. She's the wrong race. She's the wrong culture. Everything. She's lit. That's it. She's out there trying to find something. Well, there's a fellow by the name of Boaz. Boaz ain't no dummy. Boaz sees a good-looking woman, something gets on his mind. And he sees her over there. Go over there and tell her not to glean in anybody else's fields. Glean in mine. And tell the boys not to mess with her. And give her more than she needs. Something picking up. She gets home, she tells Naomi, and Naomi is the matchmaker of all matchmakers. It's, it's big time now. I mean, big time. Naomi knows that this is the richest man in the country. She also knows that she is kin to him by her husband and her boys. That she could be redeemed as part of his property. And so the plot thickens. It gets better. So she says, now, Ruth, you need to dress up and put on some of that good smelling stuff and uh, get yourself fixed up here. Put a little something here and there. And you go down there because tonight he'll lay down on the threshing floor and he'll go to sleep. He's had a big meal, drank a little wine. He's laying there asleep. You go get up underneath the cover at his feet. See, I told you to get in the rest. There ain't nobody sleep right now, my Lord. I mean, you can leave them over there in Moab, but right now, business picking up. Sometime during the night, Moab kind of stretches. What is that at my foot? And all of a sudden, this woman stands up and says, Boo. No, she didn't say that. Boaz is tore all to pieces. He's got a sudden anointing to be a husband. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? You, how could you ever come up with something like And she says, Mr. Boaz, I want you to take care of me. I don't have anywhere to go. And he said, let me get him here, girl. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, let me get dressed. <laughs> he said, I'm going to take care of this. And he knows he's got to go because there's one person standing between him. And he goes down there. Oh, Lord, she's videoing this. It's rated G, G, so. He goes over and tells this guy, look, you can have this, but we can redeem Elimelech's property, and you stand bet you're closer than I am. Can I get your permission? Well, he says, you get, you get his property and you get his, his wife, but you also get the mother-in-law. I imagine he said, I'm not interested there, so you can have it. He takes a shoe and goes up at the city gate and shows it and says, I'm going to have that woman for my wife. And guess what? They did. They got married. It wasn't long after that. The wedding bell started. Yep, about the end, brother. Just in about five more minutes. This get, could get deeper than what, what we've been before. See. <laughs> so they get married. And they get married. Hey, lady, bring that baby up here, man. You bring your baby. Bring your baby here, man. I need help. I need help preaching. Just bumps. Bumps. Oh, my. Come right on down here and help me preach, man. Number one grandmother right here now. Yeah. When it seems like everything was gone, Ruth marries Boaz. Naomi has never had a child. I mean, uh, the grandchild. Her two boys are dead. Everything is gone. She's got nothing. But when Ruth gives birth to this baby, 
she comes over and puts it in Naomi's arms. Now, I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about Poor old Naomi been through the pause, the maxi pause, every kind of pause. <laughs> she said, I'm a dead woman. I can't do nothing. When they laid that baby into Naomi's arms, she started nursing the baby. I want to tell you today, God wants to put a brand new ministry in somebody's life. When nothing, everything is gone, somebody wants to come over and say, here, this is the restorer of your life. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, that would be the end of it. Except they named that baby Obed. But the baby had a baby and his name was Jesse. And Jesse had a whole house full of boys, but one of them's name was David. And the scepter shall not depart until Shiloh comes. And David came and began the kingdom in Israel. And it wasn't too many years and, and a generation, several generations down the road that there's a little 15-year-old girl that tells her, uh, her uh, uh, spouse husband, I'm pregnant. He says, you're what? I'm pregnant. Well, the angel had to explain it to him. But notice... She was of the same lineage as David and got to go back to Bethlehem. And so she says, to her, uh, or Joseph says, sir, we'll have to go to Bethlehem to, because I've got to go and pay my taxes. And he puts this 15-year-old girl on the back of a donkey. They ride 65 miles down the road. And when they get to Bethlehem, there's no place to go, but there's an announcement made. The announcement is made in heaven. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Hi, my. Would you stand with me, please? I know that's two words you might have been wanting to hear. Please say Can you play for me? Yes, sir. You know, things happen. Problems come. I just kind of feel like maybe some of you have not been like me. You know, you go through dry spells. And you really need the touch of the Lord. You need God to lay a brand new minister in your heart. Here's a church that's full. And something is about to happen to you. There are people that never thought they'd ever take care of a Sunday school class. They thought they would never do anything else. But God has got something in store for you. A brand new day. A whole new ministry. Would you like to receive a touch from the Lord today? Would you like for God to give you a fresh anointing? To take care of the confusion of your life. How many today would like to have a fresh touch of God? Would you raise your hand? Yes. Oh, I just know that God's going to do something here today. This is Bethlehem. This is the city of bread. God wants to place that brand new opportunity in you today.